The Egyptians were very religious people. In fact, it's what drove this group of people to do mostly everything that they did. Even the things that are still seen today owe to their religion. In this episode, we'll take a look at the culture of the Egyptians. Welcome to the History of the Bible podcast. Episode 20, Egypt Now that we have finished going through the book of Job, we will now go back to Exodus, as that was the next book in chronological order. But before we get into the book itself, we're going to look at Egypt and its culture. A Byzantine historian named Constantus Manassas, who lived around 1187 AD, wrote that the Egyptian state lasted 1,663 years. He was taking into account that the date of the Egyptian empire fell was after the Persian king named Cambyses in the year 526 BC. Counting backwards from 526 BC, that would give us the date of 2188 BC that the Egyptian state was founded. This is thought to be about 40 to 60 years after the birth of Phileg. Phileg is the fourth generation after Noah and the flood. His name means division or divided. Because it says in Genesis 10 verse 25 that the earth was divided in his days. This is thought to be the division of people on the earth, which is recorded in Genesis chapter 11. The Tower of Babel would have happened in his days. The flood happened around the years 2349 and 2348 BC and Phileg was born about 100 years after the flood in 2247 BC. The Tower of Babel happened and God confused their languages. The son of Ham, named Mizraim, led his family into what is now known as Egypt. This is why the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mizraim, as well as the land of Ham. The Egyptian empire was probably about 400,000 square miles, which is a little less than twice the size of Texas. But not all of it was populated. Even today, it isn't all populated. In ancient Egypt, the citizens lived near and around the Nile River, as it was the only source of water in the country. For a while, Egypt was split into two separate kingdoms, but it would eventually be united as one kingdom. The Egyptian Empire's history is split up into three main sections. The Old, Middle, and New Kingdom are those three different sections. It was during the Old Kingdom that the Great Pyramids were built. During this time period is when kingship really came into a prominent role in the Egyptian society. The pharaohs were thought to be somehow connected to the gods. Most of the citizens at this point were just farmers, living in small villages. During this time, the kingdom also enjoyed a golden era. The king of Egypt held all the power and was a central point for the government. However, their power would not last. As the years went on from generation to generation, the priesthood and nobility began to grow in power and would take much of the influence that the king held. This would eventually dissolve the central government and cause the collapse of the old kingdom period. Before the middle kingdom began, there was a period called the first intermediate period, which is known for its time of civil war and chaos as the different Egyptian governors fought for power. The kingdom would be split up into two different kingdoms again, but eventually would come back under one rule again before the Middle Kingdom period. The Middle Kingdom saw the same type of flourishing happen in the kingdom as was seen in the Old Kingdom. This time though, not only did the Egyptians focus on building more pyramids, they also focused externally. They would colonize Nebia as it was known for its great wealth of gold Military fortresses were built and trade relations were built with other foreign kingdoms in the Palestine region. However, it too would not last. Again, the central government would begin to fall apart starting with the last king of this period and would completely dissolve when his sister came to rule. This being the first confirmed female ruler of Egypt. But it wouldn't last long as all control was lost under her in three years of her reign. This would lead to another intermediate period between the Middle and New Kingdom. During this time period is when the Hyksos came into power by capitalizing on the insecure government. The Hyksos are the foreigners that had immigrated into the Delta Nile from the West during the Middle Kingdom period. 
They would take control of the delta and rule there until the Egyptian king that lived in the south would regain control over the whole kingdom again. This would bring about the new kingdom. During this time is when Egypt really began to use military force to conquer large amounts of land. From the Nile River all the way up to the Euphrates River. Because of the military conquest, they would once again step into a golden age that brought great wealth to the kingdom. Although during this time, the kings wouldn't be buried in pyramids anymore. They would be put into large cut tombs on the west side of the Nile known as the Valley of the Kings. But their fortune wouldn't last forever. Eventually, as other Mesopotamian empires grew, they were unable to take the land that Egypt once held. And the cost of war was expensive, not only wealth, but also in lives. This would be the history for the Egyptians for the next 700 years or so, until finally the Egyptian kingdom was fully conquered by Augustus in 31 BC and became part of the Roman Empire. And although before being conquered by Augustus, they would be their own kingdom serving other empires, such as the Persian and Greek empires, but they would still be their own people until Rome fully conquered them. The Egyptian people would be thought of as people that were fascinated by death. However, some say that it wasn't death that they were caught up in, but life after death, or the continuation of life. It was believed that the body, an image, and the name of the person that had died were all that was needed to be preserved for the person to live on in the afterlife. This is why the Egyptians began to mummify the bodies of people that had died, which led some of the greatest and most iconic sites of the ancient world, such as the Great Pyramids. In reality, the pyramids in Egypt were just giant tombs that held the leading citizens and leaders of Egypt. And although the other citizens couldn't afford such extravagant tombs as the pharaohs, they did have family tombs that held the body after being embalmed. But despite the class of the citizens, the burial ceremony for the Egyptian people was taken very seriously. Although not all Egyptians could afford it, after someone had died, the body would be taken to the embalmers, who with the priest would perform the embalming of the body. The process for embalming the body started out with drying out the body. In order to do this, the body needed to be drained of all of its fluids, and then the internal organs were removed. Although the removal of internal organs had a religious meaning to it, it was also practical, as it was usually the part of the body that began to decay first. This would include the brain. However, the issue was that the embalmers didn't want to harm the face itself. Otherwise, it would affect the one that had died in the afterlife. So they came up with a creative way to remove the brain without harming the face. It would either be done of one of two ways. The first way was that they would make a small incision in the neck and go up into the skull. The other way was that the embalmers would go through the nose with some type of tool to remove the brain. Once the brain was removed, it was disposed of because it was not important to the Egyptian culture. You see, they believed that the heart was the important part of the body in the afterlife. From the heart came the memories that they would hold on to of their life on earth in the afterlife. And it was these memories that would allow for the one that had died to pass judgment. And for this reason, they would keep the heart inside the body when embalmed. And because the heart is mostly muscle, it wouldn't decay as fast as the other organs inside of the body. The other organs inside the body would be removed and treated on their own separate from the body. Either they would be embalmed and placed into jars that would be placed in the tomb with the body, or they would be put back into the body after the embalming was finished. Next was the process of allowing for the body to dry out completely, which usually took about 40 to 70 days. During this time, the coffin would be created for the body. This task would include the making of the wooden coffin itself, usually made out of local Egyptian wood. Once the coffin was made, it would be time to paint different types of paintings on it usually of gods and goddesses inside the coffin, and then a portrait of the person on the outside of the coffin, as well as writings to protect the person's journey into the afterlife. After the body was fully dried out, oils would be rubbed into the body to make the skin soft, so that it wouldn't become brittle as well as take away any smell of decaying. The body would then be wrapped like you would expect a mummy to look like. 
The body then would be decorated with jewelry as well as a mask that would be placed on the face of the body. A parade of the body, family, friends, colleagues, priests for the rituals, hired mourners would all head to the tomb. Before placing the body into the tomb, the priest would perform one more ceremony. He would use a special tool that would be placed to open the mouth of the mask on the body. The reason they did this was because the Egyptians believed that if the mouth wasn't open, then the person would not be able to eat, drink, breathe, or talk in the afterlife. All very important things, especially if the deceased needed to give an account of his life at judgment. With that, the body would be placed inside of the tomb. The tombs that were used to house the body of the Egyptians were very different in style, but the ones that we are familiar with today are the pyramids of Egypt. Today there are about a hundred different pyramids, but 17 of them are considered great as they all vary in size. Because the Egyptians believed their pharaohs had a divine right to rule, they of course would receive the largest and best tombs to help them get to the afterlife in style. The most commonly known pyramid is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This tomb was built on the west side of the Nile. The reason that it was built on the west side was because this was seen as the holy side and had connection to the afterlife as this was also the side where the sun disappeared every day. Therefore, Egypt built most of their cemeteries, tombs, and mortuary temples there. However, there were people that lived on the west side of the Nile, but they were mostly priests, guards, and workers that lived there. As the Great Pyramids were on the west side, it belonged to the pharaoh named Khufu. Not much is known about this guy, except that he built one of the seven wonders that is still around today. The height of the pyramid when it was first constructed was about 482 feet, and the smaller ones around it are for his queens. The other larger pyramids around the main one is for Khufu's sons and grandsons. His son's tomb would have the Sphinx statue, which would be later worshipped in the local area as an image of one of their gods. But the pyramids are quite the building project. For Khufu's temple alone, it needed around 2 to 3 million blocks of stone to be cut and transported for the project, and each stone would average around 2.5 tons each, but there are some that are as heavy as 15 tons. These blocks were brought in from Aswan, which is about 600 miles away from the building project, as well as nearby quarry that was only about 1,600 feet away. These type of pyramids were built long before the Israelites became slaves in Egypt. It is thought that in the off-season of farming, that the villagers would go to the west side of the Nile and help build the pyramids. Graves around the pyramids show that most of the builders were Egyptian and probably around 20,000 people worked on building it. In these cemeteries around the pyramids, the bones of the workers show fractured bones that indicate a large, heavy weight fell on it. But with the Egyptian medical treatment, the bones were able to grow back together. This shows that the pyramids were not built from people from outer space, but actual living human beings brought the stones in and built the pyramids. Many debates have come up about the construction of the pyramids, whether the stones were casted, like we see done today with cement blocks where a mold is created and then filled with cement to create a block, or carved from natural stone and then brought in. The biggest cause to believe that the stones were casted is due to the fact of how they would move such large stones without modern day construction equipment. However, not much else supports the idea that they were casted. Although there was some plastering done to fill in the gaps between the stones, that is the only evidence that shows that they would have been casted. Again, the only reason that it is thought to be casted was because they didn't have the equipment that we have today. Another reason is because evolutionists do not believe that people that long ago were intellectually capable to create such great engineering structures as the pyramids without today's tools. There's actually more evidence to show that these blocks were carved out of natural rocks and then moved to the location. The quarry that the blocks came from show that there are large square cutouts from which the blocks came out of. Also, the path can be seen where the blocks came up from the curry to the pyramids. Another thing is that a lot of the stones used in the pyramids have a ton of marine fossils inside of them. One, this again points to a worldwide flood, 
as how could marine fossils be found in the desert? And two, this points to the blocks were actually cut out. Because if the blocks were casted, they would need to grind up the stones to make it cement texture so that it could be poured. Therefore, it would destroy the fossils inside of them. So the blocks were large cut stones. But how did they get them there? No one knows for sure, but many theories have come up. Most likely, the stones were dragged up on some type of ramp, but which kind of ramp is even debated? From ramps that go straight at the pyramid, but the ramp would need to start pretty far back, to ramps that circle around the structure itself, and as the pyramid got higher, the ramp too would get higher. Others have suggested that there could have been ramps inside of the structure itself that could have been used to build it, but again, no one knows how they did it. Another thing that makes it even more difficult of a task, as the Egyptians most likely didn't use wheels as they would have gotten stuck in the sand, instead of what they probably used for sleds that held the large blocks while they were pulled up by animals and people. It has been said that there weren't really any secular or non-religious aspects to Egyptian culture. Everything was somehow connected to their religion. Their arts, temples that covered the land, the ruler was thought to be semi-divine, names were connected to the gods, and even their writing was thought to have been given to them by their gods. One of the reasons that religion was a part of every aspect of their lives was because of the Egyptian people wanted to rationalize everything that they saw. For example, the sun. To them, the sun was either carried by a boat across the sky, just like a person crossing the Nile, or that it was a giant orb that was pushed by a scarab or a dung beetle. What is interesting is that the Egyptian cults would tell multiple stories to explain one thing. And in their mind, all of them would be true. For example, the way human beings came to being. In their story of creation, there was a mound, which is why the pyramids are the way they are, because they are thought to resemble this mound from creation. On this mound, either a phoenix-like bird makes so much noise that poof, there comes life, or the god of tomb was on the mound and he created the other gods through his spit or sperm. Other creation stories for the Egyptians say that a ram god created humans on potter's wheel or that the god Ptah just thought of them and they were created. Again, the Egyptians saw all of these stories as being true at once or that they all had truth to them. This type of religion would stay the same, for the most part, throughout the Egyptian empire. The reason for it to last nearly 3,000 years is that the Egyptians held the past in high regard as it was passed down from their forefathers. For the most part, the Egyptians strove to live comfortable and easy lives. It didn't have any hiccups, so to speak, in their lives. They explained everything that was mysterious to them with something that they could observe. The afterlife was thought to be a continuation of life. So much so that some of the tombs were made out to look exactly like the person's house, even with bathrooms in them. Most cities for the Egyptian people were on the east side of the Nile, as this is where the sun came up every morning because it had connection to the living in their religion. The people mostly lived in villages and towns, whereas really only the elite dwelt in large cities such as Thebes and Memphis later in times. Their housing was usually made out of mud bricks, as good building wood was not native to the Nile Valley, so it was imported mostly from Lebanon. It is thought that the population of the Egyptian Empire during the Old Kingdom to be anywhere from 1 to 1 and a half million people. Later on, it would grow to be about 3 to 4 million people. The land itself was owned by Pharaoh. This is not only seen in extra-biblical evidence, but it can be seen that when the seven-year famine happened while Joseph was in power, that the land was sold to Pharaoh so that the people could have food to eat. After the famine, the people would once again farm the land, but the land was still owned by the pharaohs, and the farmers had to pay a portion of their crops for using the land. Only the elite and higher priests were able to own their own land. The everyday lives of the Egyptian people can be found very much like the lives of people today. They are taught not to steal or lie, honor their parents, take care of the old, to show up to your job and give it the best that you had, all while honoring their superiors. 
Personal care was very important, so much so that facial hair was considered unclean. They were told to have fun as a child, but as they got older, they were expected to get an education and to find a job. After finding a job, they would find a spouse to marry and to start a family. They had board games that they played with one another. They had toys to play with. The pet dogs had a collar that they would wear. Women had equal rights as the men. The family was thought to be the center of society. And although there were divorces in ancient Egypt, it was costly. The reason was because women had just about the same status and culture. So they could initiate divorces with their husbands and were able to own and run their own land. The Egyptian empire was mostly based on agriculture, chiefly around wheat and barley. And although the empire was based in the desert, it had an annual flooding of the Nile that would water and fertilize the land of the Nile River that watered and fertilized the Nile Valley for crops. Early on, the Egyptians created a series of channels that allowed for the water from the annual flooding of the Nile to be directed to a water reservoir. And then from the water reservoir, it provided water for the rest of the year for the crops. Another thing that Egypt was known for was papyrus, which grew abundantly in the marshes of the Nile. This would be used for rope, mats, and sandals, and then later on it would be exported to be used for writing materials. The Egyptians raised cattle, sheep, rams, and pigs, all that would be raised to be eaten. Donkeys were raised as well, but they were mostly used for transportation. Many birds were eaten as well, such as ducks and geese, but also many wild migrating birds. On top of this, the Nile provided a large amount of fish for the Egyptians to consume. Animals such as lions and wild cattle were hunted, but it was only done by the elite. For pets, the Egyptians would have dogs, cats, and monkeys. But the cats had a very special place in their society. So much so that if someone killed a cat, they could have faced capital punishment. Names of Egyptian citizens were usually based on the person's origins, occupation, or status. But other times they were named after phrases. These phrases were usually honoring the gods. What also caused the Egyptian religion to be part of every aspect of life was that most of their priestly positions were part-time and would then hold a regular job or position alongside their priestly duties. It's been found that on top of being a priest, they had jobs such as being a royal scribe for the pharaoh, mayor, judges, copper and goldsmith, gardeners, and they were even some that were part of the military at the same time. Only the high priest held the distinction of being the high priest and was usually a full-time position. The high priest wore garments and jewelry that showed their status. There was a group of priests that was distinguished by their ability to read. They were thought to hold a knowledge of the mysteries, as they were called by the Egyptians. Much like the Catholic Church did during the medieval times, in which the priests were the only ones that were really able to read the Bible, which caused the people to be over-dependent on them. This group of priests were usually held by members of the royal family. However, as time went on, the group grew to other groups of people. And as the group continued to grow, it would often compete for power with a pharaoh at the same time. The pharaoh himself, and a couple of occasions herself, were thought to be ordained by the gods. And although the pharaoh was thought to be semi-divine, the position of being pharaoh is thought to be where they received their divinity. So it wasn't so much that they thought the person was born from the gods, but that the position of being pharaoh was ordained by the gods, and that anyone who held this position was therefore made semi-divine. In essence, the pharaoh was a person that was between man and the gods. They would represent or manifest the gods to the people through their position and by the rituals that were done in their position. However, in a way, the pharaoh was also a representation of the people to the gods through offerings. The pharaoh would be the center of power. However, as time went on, he would become the head of the bureaucratic state. The bureaucratics would then be part of the elite group of people that really only made up 5% of the Egyptian empire. Although the elite were supposed to help run the empire, it would eventually pull the power away from the rulers and begin to break down the central government. Eventually, it would cause the kingdom to fall. The Egyptian military in the beginning was not an organized group of soldiers. 
It was made up of local militias that were commanded by local officials. It wasn't until later on that the Egyptian empire had a standing army. So this is a culture that the Israelites would live in. So join us next time as we begin the book of Exodus and see the love that God has for his people in episode 21, The Great Departure. Thanks for listening to the History of the Bible podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you were to take a few moments of your time and rate and review the show. And be sure to follow it too. Also tell your friends and family. If you would like to reach out to us, leave feedback directly to us, or to let us know how the show has impacted you, check out the links in the show notes. Until next time, remember that you are loved, special, and worthwhile.